was trying to prevent actually the Egyptians from gaining and, and overpowering. They were, they were afraid because God had blessed them and they were multiplying so quickly that he had to do something about that. Exodus 1, 15 and 16. King of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives whose names were uh, Chipra and Pua. I thought that was kind of good names, you know? What's their name? Chipra and Pua. We're, um, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see the baby as a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. That sounds kind of horrible. Here are the midwives. They're supposed to kill the baby boys, let the girls live. But we find out in verse 17, the midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Here's a good example, early example, of doing what God says and not what man says. And that's something that all through the generations we have to be careful that we do what God says and not worry as much about what man says. Because there will be kings and there will be dictators, there will be presidents, there will be rulers. There will be people that tell us to go contrary to our Christian faith, beliefs, what the Bible says, and we're not to do any of that. Just like these two uh, servants. Aaron, his sister Miriam, and their parent, when they had the, the birth coming and the baby was going to be born in that after that edict coming for killing him, they had to be worried. They had to be worried. They had to be concerned because they did something extraordinary. They took and put the baby in a basket and put him out in the Nile. Then the girl, Miriam, she watched. And then God led that baby right to Pharaoh's daughter. This was such an amazing work of God. And when we see back and we see exactly how it happened, and we just say, Praise God, because when they put that baby in the water, that probably had to be the hardest thing that a mother had to do. But if she didn't, the baby would have been killed. So here is the only chance for living. And she had enough faith to put that baby in the water. Aaron grew up. He knew he had a brother, the mother. She ended up being a caretaker for him. They knew their brother, but they couldn't associate with him. He, it was in a different realm. He, had, he lived in the palace. He was a grandson for all practical purposes of the pharaoh. And then you had them and the slaves in the quarters. He knew he had a brother, but he didn't have the relationship with him. But in Exodus 4, 27 through 31, we're told that the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness and meet Moses. So I met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had, said, had sent him to say and also about the signs he had commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of Israelites and Aaron told them everything that the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people and they believed. And when they heard the Lord was concerned about them and they had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped him. Here you've got Aaron... Moses, you remember what was some of his excuses for not wanting to go? That was one of them, right? He finally, just that last one, when he angered God, was just said, no, I don't want to do it. Well, one of his excuses was he couldn't speak. He says, well, don't you have a brother named Aaron? He speaks well. He'll do the speaking for you. Very limited amount did Aaron speak to Moses. Moses seemed to be able to do quite well on his own after his excuses ran out. But Here's the time, another reason that Aaron probably come into play, is because Moses had been part of the oppressors, really, and then there had been all kinds of stuff. He had to flee the, the Egyptians, and then when he goes back, if he had went back on his own without Aaron, they might not have accepted him. But when he took Aaron with him, Aaron who had been all of his life with him, they listened to him. God makes the way. He opens the doors. He makes the ways smooth for us. But people change quickly, very quickly. Exodus 32, 1 through 17. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods, who will go before us. And for this 
As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. As for this fellow Moses, he's the one that led them through the desert, got them out, bringing them out, saving them from slavery. And now, as to this fellow, we don't know what's become of him. Aaron answered them, take off your gold earrings. Take off your gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. So he tells them, give me all the gold. Bring it all to me. And they did. So then he took what they gave him and he made it into an idol. He cast it in the shape of a calf, fastening it, or fashioning it with a tool. Then, now listen to this word, they said, this was not Aaron speaking, then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. The people took and looked at that golden calf as their god who saved them from slavery. Now you might ask yourself, how could they do that? They'd seen the miracles God had done. They'd been led out of slavery. He'd fed them, given them water, given them protection. How could they turn to this calf? When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. Before, he's not telling them to worship the calf. He's telling them tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. The people are choosing to worship this calf. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings, presented uh, fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat, drink, and got up to indulge in revelry. One translation said orgies. There was probably sexually involvement there. Um, sometimes we blame Aaron for doing that. He made the calf. He was wrong. But when God brought justice against the Israelites, what justice did he bring against Aaron? None. None. Interesting. I read several commentaries on that, and I've got several different explanations for it. But we honestly don't know why God did not bring judgment on Aaron, because it looks to my eyes like Aaron did wrong. But then again, maybe God was using him to weed out the ones that were going to do this to begin with. I, I really don't know. I do know one thing. Humans are not created to be godless. We're not created to be godless. If we don't know the true God, we'll make our own gods. Be it in the Old Testament, be it in the New Testament, be it a thousand years ago, or if we're still here a thousand years from now, if we don't know God, we'll make a God. We have an absolute need, a subconscious awareness that we need direction, we need relationships, we need a purpose from someone greater than ourselves. If what we are is the greatest, we would, we would fall away. We would just melt away because we're not sufficient unto ourselves. God created us for a relationship. He created us to have a relationship with him. We broke that relationship. God didn't. We did. We broke that relationship. But we did not lose this genetic makeup that we have inside us, this, this some people call it this, this God hole in our heart that has to be filled only by God. We've got this genetic makeup that says we need, have to, worship, and serve God. And when we don't do that, we're going to serve some God. The story of the Bible is really a story about God and humankind working on this relationship. God trying to repair it, man trying to break it. Constant, constant battle. We see the story played out in the Old Testament, New Testament, all through the pages of this Bible that you have sitting right there in your hand is this story being played out of a relationship that's broken with God. Human history shows it, and our lives show it. It's a story of a lost people and a loving God. That's what the Bible is. Story of a lost people, us, and a loving God. It's also the story of weak people and a strong God. It's a 
story about a God who seeks us out even when we don't seek him out. If people were ever going to experience a highest relationship with God ever, it would have had to have been the Israelites at this time. All the things that God had done for them, taking care of them, the provision, the logistically, what he supplied to them coming out of Egypt, I forgot now, but it, how many railroad cars a day, it was phenomenal, the amount of food and substance they had to have rather than die. God supplied it all. They seen it. They had the cloud guiding them. They had the pillar of fire. They seen it. They seen the water split. They walked through the They seen it. And yet, and yet, what Moses do? Stays a little too long on the mountain for him. Don't know about this fellow. Don't know where he went. Make us a God. Their nation was being born. And they were already giving it away. They were the chosen people. They were to be God's witnesses to a lost world. But they threw all that away. People then and people now are fickle at best and rebellious by nature. That's what we are. We're fickle. But we're also rebellious. In their impatience, because this fellow had gone up to the mountain too long, they forgot. They forgot all the things that God had done. And they turned to Aaron to create other gods. It's a direct violation of the first of uh, two commandments. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves an idol. Well, I'm certainly glad that you and I never put anything else in front of God and that we never have anything that we worship or care for any physical possessions because we're way past that, right? Can I, can, what? No, nope. I'm not getting no amens here. <laughs> the Israelites turned away from God. They lost their faith, their trust. Instead of trusting God and waiting upon Him, they chose to take things in their own hands. They're going to fix it themselves. God wasn't moving quick enough for them. <clears throat> talking to a dear sweet lady today. I love her dearly. She's got concerns with her great grandchildren and grandchildren and children. And she's had a lot of tragedy in her life. She prays and she calls me and we pray together. This woman, this woman has never once in my life that I know of lost where her focus is on God. But if you were to ask her, she would tell you she has. She constantly is praying for more strength, more faith. I pray to have one-tenth of her faith and strength. And she's praying for more. That's what we each should be doing. Don't be content. Can we relate to the people in Israel? Maybe. Probably. Do we lose our faith when God who has chosen to deliver us but he doesn't answer our prayers quick enough so do we go our own way do we want to do things our way or do we submit to him in prayer in worship do we quietly wait or do we demand answers when we do we break this relationship that we have with God yes Christians can break the relationship with God. Listen to me carefully. I don't believe you can break your salvation. You're in God's hand. But you can break your relationship with him. You can break that relationship just like your children can break the relationship with you. Never changes them being your children. I was born into the family of God. But I can be a disobedient child. God has a plan for our lives. That plan includes Christ saving us by his sacrifice. And us being in joyful, joyful obedience to his plan. But when we take our eyes off God, we seek to fill that void with something else. 
Could be alcohol, could be drugs, could be marital affairs, could be money, possessions, anything. It can be anything. Could be food. Here's a hint. I told you there's some sins the church accepts and lives with every day. I'll give you a preview. One is, what do you think? Starts with a G. Gluttony. Ooh, yeah, I'm going to talk about us overeating, but that's down the road. We, when we get away from God, lose everything and it happens quickly. We don't, gradually, I don't think we pull away from God. I think if we are exposed to the word of God, if we come in fellowship together, if we come and participate, we're reinforced. We're reinforced. And when we start to slide a little bit, it's noticeable. Other people notice it. We're given hope and encouragement by our brothers, or by our sisters, by our fellowship. But what happens when we don't assemble together? What happens when we go our own way? What happens when we're going to fix this relationship with God all on our own? What do we end up doing? Falling further and further and further away. You've seen it happen to people you love. You've seen it happen to people you know, and it may or may not have happened to you at some point in your life. It certainly did me. This is what we do when we don't fellowship regularly, when we don't trust God. We don't know about this fellow on the mountain, so we're going to go ahead and fix it ourselves. The Israelites made a golden calf. One moment, one moment God's rescuing us following Christ and we're joyous. Then we find ourselves in bondage again. This bondage that caused us so much pain and confusion. Same bondage the Israelites wished for rather than to go forward. They wished to go back. Are there not enough graves, graves in Egypt? They were mad because they weren't having it their way. We live in a society that is self-absorbed materialistic. And friends, we have to watch it closely. We try to live a life of worship, prayer, faithfulness, and when we're successful with that, we find real freedom and joy. We mature as human beings and as Christians. We become new creations, as we're told. Then the t going gets tough. Things happen to us. Bad things sometimes happen to us. When this happens, do we continue to rely upon the strength of God, the source of our strength, or do we quickly turn to our golden calves? I listed some that I kind of run across my mind as might be in the golden calves. The malls and shopping, the bars and alcohol, the gyms and working out, the television, the internet, the refrigerator, the local drug dealer. Could be any above and more, but we fill that void with something. The quality of our Christian journey, the quality of our lives, and the effectiveness of our witness for Jesus Christ depends upon our choices that we make during these trials. It's not when things are going good that we make these big decisions. It's when things are going bad. When we stand strong and faithful, when things are going the absolute worst against us, that's when we're enriching other people. My joyous testimony when I live a comfortable life does not have much effect. But if I'm being persecuted, if I get released from prison like Paul, and go right back out and start preaching again, 2,000 years later that makes a difference. What are we doing that makes a difference 2,000 years from now? We're surrounded by things that go for our attention. Some of it, our work, family. Some of it, our, our desires. Some of it, what we call a hobby or what we want to do. We're, we're surrounded with it. And if we start drifting away from the true meaning of serving God, we will be right there in that broken relationship. Then we find it harder and harder to follow Christ. 
Have you ever missed three or four Sundays? Tell me how easy it was to go back on that fifth Sunday to church. Because people are going, where you been? How come you've been gone? Now, is it they're nosy or they care? Probably both. Probably both. It's hard to do. We get angry. We have jealousy. We find that our Christian faith doesn't mean as much to us anymore. And I'm not talking about momentary questioning of God. I've called out to God asking him why. When we lose somebody dear and near to us, it's okay to ask God why. It's okay. God can handle tough questions. But once we've asked our tough questions, we need to go back to worshiping, loving, and keeping our relationship with God. We can't let that tough question separate us from God. Because Satan will do that. He will cleave us with any relationship. He wants to stop your testimony. Because if he can't take your salvation, and he can't, he wants to stop you from bringing other people to salvation. That's his task with Christians. Take your joy, take your testimony, take your witness, and then let you go on and live. When you die, he doesn't care. In our Old Testament lesson, the people, their actions deserved to be condemned. They turned away. But God did not turn away from Israel. The Bible is our story. Like so many before us and so many after us, the Bible is our story. And it's all about two things. part we really love is grace, but there's also judgment. Judgment comes as God allows us to live in the consequences of our own decisions. You know, sometimes I've heard people say, if I come into the church, the roof will fall on my head. I assure them that's not true, because we have a section that's reinforced just for the sinners. I let them know that. They're perfectly safe in a church. But God lets us live and our mess that we create for ourselves. Some of us are still living in the mess that we've created from years ago. Illegitimate children, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, unfaithfulness, immorality. You're forgiven of those, but you still live with the consequences of those. That's the judgment. We really don't like that part. The part we like is the grace part. Because God abounds in grace. It's unmerited. Our invitation, which allows us to, to live in God's decisions and reap the wonderful benefits. When God reaches out to us and we follow his plan, we are joyous. We are blessed. God's calling every one of us, you and me and every one of us, to throw away our golden calf whatever it may be. Whatever yours is, whatever mine is, needs to be thrown away. We're to embrace our salvation. We're to embrace our relationship with God. For the Bible is the story of our lives. When the book of Revelation ends, the Genesis begins. In a garden, humankind is in perfect relationship with our Creator and with one another. That's how the story of the Bible ends. In a garden. Perfect relationship one more time. Can I get an amen? amen? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless the message. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your gift of salvation. I thank you for my, the grace that you have given me. And I have never, ever merited any grace, but you have given so abundantly. I thank you for each of the folks here tonight. I thank you for their faithfulness in coming to worship together, to serve you, to listen to your word. Father, I pray that you continue to bless each one and strengthen us when we're weak. Strengthen us when we fall short, Father, as we will. But let us support one another. Let us bring hope to one another. Let us love and care for one another as true brothers and sisters in Christ. 
I pray that in Jesus' name, his holy name. The entire congregation said,